Jesus says, uh, can we turn with you? Let's go to uh, John chapter 14. And everyone knows this verse of scripture. Because when you get saved, they put it in your mind. Chapter, chapter 14 of John. And why don't you read for me verse 6. And Jesus said unto them, unto him, and Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Okay. Everyone knows that verse of scripture. We teach it. We preach it. Fine. Before that, he says, I am going away to prepare a place for you. Right? Mm -hmm. And where I'm going, you cannot come right now because I have to go there first. Amen? Mm -hmm. Where is that place? Anybody tell me? Okay, heaven. Good. Father, okay, good. I'm sure you're gonna, everybody's going to give me the correct answer. But in Jewish thinking, I want you to see something else. Yeah. Remember I said the tabernacle of Moses and the pattern? There's a pattern there that we must understand before we come to truly worship through that. We have to understand who Christ is. He is also called in the Old Testament and the New Testament the high priest. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. And so now Jesus... And I told, I told this, and I'm going to tell all you uh, Bible scholars here, and I, I want to challenge you with this, and I want you to challenge yourself. If you study the tabernacle of Moses like I have, I tell people this. If you hear a word being preached or taught, and you cannot relate it back to the tabernacle, and somehow or some way, God did not speak. And you say, that's incredible. I didn't say that knowledge can't speak. Knowledge can speak. People have knowledge. But when you want a true word from God, it must be applied to the tabernacle because that is the pattern forever. Every message that I preach or I teach, I can go back to the tabernacle and apply it some way, whether it be to the altar, whether it be to the light, whether it be to the altar of incense. There is somewhere that that message has to be applied. Guarantee it. Now that's a challenge because now you have to go study it and say, wow. So Jesus is teaching the disciples the role of the true high priest. Remember in Hebrews, if you want to go to Hebrews with me, please go to Hebrews chapter 1. Long ago God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. Okay, and in, 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 in times past, God spoke in many ways and in many different ways and times through the prophets. Go ahead. And now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. Okay, so now it is brought down the pipeline to one person, Christ, right? Okay, go ahead. God promised everything to the son as an inheritance, and through the son he created the universe. The son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God, and mm -hmm. he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. Word. When he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. This shows that the Son is far greater than the angels, just as the name of the name God gave him is greater than the That's good. Name. That's good right there. Now, notice that he says he went after he finished, he purified us, not purify himself. That's right. The Bible tells in the Old Testament that every high priest that was chosen had to purify themselves first before they can enter into service. Because they were sinful, because they had sin. Not Jesus. Jesus purified us from the sin and he went and sat down. Why does the Bible say that he went and sat down? Because if you study the tabernacle of Moses, I remember I told you, any message you hear, you, you can go back to the tabernacle. The tabernacle of Moses, in that tabernacle, had many different furnishings, but there was not one single chair. Because the high priest and the, and the Levites had to always sacrifice. They always had to work. They always had to be on duty. Always... But Jesus gives one sacrifice, and then he goes and sits down. That's it. No more sacrifices. So he says, I am going away to prepare, prepare a place for you. And this is what he did as the high priest. I don't know how it looked or how it was done, but it had to be done this way. As far as him entering in. He had to go into the Father's presence after 
he died. After he says, into your hands I commend my spirit, I give you my spirit, and he dies, or he gives his life, because no one took his life from him. He gave his life. Jesus is the only one who can step out of his body and go anywhere he wants, because he's God. He goes to heaven, and he goes into the, into the, into the presence of his Father, and somehow, some way, he showed himself, his blood, whatever you want to call it, however you want to call it, as the high priest, and he puts the blood on the mercy seat. Yes. Yes. And he declares the sacrifice and the work finished. You and I and the disciples could never enter into that place because there was no blood there and the Father wanted to see the sacrifice for the people. And so Jesus Christ says, I am going away to prepare a place for you. And I said, now what kind of place? I mean, obviously the angels and Jesus are not in heaven with hammers and nails preparing mansions because it says, you know, I'm going away to prepare a mansion for you. And I've heard a lot of different translations on that and interpretations. And I realized that the place that he was talking about was at the very throne room of God. We could never abide there as a people because we could not get in there. But Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you there in that place so that you can abide there. How many times do you say, Lord, we come to the throne of grace in your prayers? Oh Lord, we stand before your throne. Show me in the Old Testament where there's even language like that in a prayer. Are you with me? All right, now watch this. Let's go to worship. I want to take you back to Genesis, Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve fell, who was on the scene right away? Come oh, on, you know the answer. Huh? Satan was there, and who came right away to correct some things? God. The Bible says that they heard his voice. Now, here's, you know what I love about the King James Version? See, other versions are good, but the King James Version puts it right where it belongs. It's spiritual. It says they heard his voice walking. Now, how do you hear a voice walking? I'm going to tell you something. They heard the voice of God, and they heard the leaves and everything moving out the way. They heard him coming. And Adam knew what he was coming for. He was coming for fellowship. He was coming to spend time, but this time, because that's how he would come, in the cool of the day. But this time, Adam knew that something happened and that God was not pleased. He was going to be judged. And yet, for the first time in Adam's life, and Eve's life, they've never even known what the judgment of God was. How many know what I'm talking about? How many know that Adam never knew what was in his mind to lust or to be angry or to be fearful? He never knew what that was, and for the first time in his life, he had to experience everything that you and I experienced. That was new to him. Right. We were born this way. Right. We grow up knowing these things. He was a man from the beginning. God didn't create Adam as a baby. He was a man. He grew up, he knew knowledge. He had everything already implanted inside of him. And for the first time, fear enters in. Lust enters in. Anger, and I mean, everything, and he says, what is going on here? Then he hears God coming, and for the first time he says, I know he's not coming to fellowship. <laughs> and the first thing he does, he hides behind a fig tree. And he becomes a tailor right away. He takes some of the leaves and he puts it around him, and he says, Adam, where are you? Well, you know where I am, you're God. Right? You know where I am. Why did God ask that? Because he wanted one response from Adam. He wanted truth. He wanted you to, I want you to be honest with me. Where are you? Because I don't see you anymore here. You fell from a place where you used to be. You're not here anymore. Where are you? And he says, the woman you gave to me. And we know the story. You've been in enough marriage seminars to know what I'm talking about. But God had to do something right away to prove to you how God's redemption plan and how God's love is so quick on the scene. He, he Listen, he, he, he pronounces judgment right away, but then he goes and God kills, slaughters an animal, and gives him the skin so that he could be redeemed right away. 
But he says, you can't stay here in this place anymore. You got to get out. Why? Because in your condition, the way you are, now that you have inherited a different DNA, taking you back to the beginning, you have a DNA inside of you right now that's not going to be able to keep you alive forever. And if you stay here and you eat from this tree of life, you're going to live in the condition that you are forever. Because that's it was called the tree of what? And the tree of life. The tree of life. That means that that tree had life in it. And so God had to take them out of the garden and then put a special angel there with a sword to guard the way. Am I right? That's right. And so they could not go in anymore. How many know that if you go to your house and you see an angel there with a flashing sword and he says, you can't come in here, he says, I ain't going in there. <laughs> right? Or you see, or you go to your house and, and the FBI puts, puts red tape all over your house and this, we confiscated your house. I don't care if you own it or not, you're not going in. So God confiscated the, the Garden of Eden and says, you're not coming in here anymore. You're going to die. And so in our... And our death situation, Jesus comes back and says, you do not have a place where I am going. So I am going there to prepare a place for you so that you can come up to where I am. Now, let's go to worship. In the beginning of that Adam and Eve, do you know what, somebody go to Romans chapter 5 for me. Do you know what brought the entire world you want to read that for me? Chapter 5 of Romans. New Testament. You might be almost the other way. There you go. Put it this way. There you go. Right before Corinthians. To the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Wow. Now, wait a minute. Why should I be a sinner if I wasn't there from the beginning? <laughs> because you have a DNA inside of you that you're going to pass on to all humanity. And guess what? Because you were thrown out of the Garden of Eden, everyone who was born after you is not going in. And so, listen to what I'm going to say, and I want you to understand this. By one act of disobedience, the whole entire world fell. Am I right? Come on. One act of disobedience. Why don't we bring it home to where it really is, okay? You ready for this? How about because of one act of worship? Because Adam and Eve, when they obeyed the devil, there was no demon. Satan himself. When they obeyed him, they vowed. They vowed the alliance to him. Without realizing the fullness of the consequence. Some of you said, I've never seen it that way before. That's why I'm here. <laughs> Maybe to show you something you've never seen before. And I'm going to prove to you that it was an act of worship. One act of worship on their behalf of obedience. How many know that your obedience to God is an act of worship? True? Every time you obey God. Am, am I right? Okay. All right. Now watch this. In chapter 5, I want you to read to, for me the last few verses of chapter 5. Give me, a, um, I believe it's uh, 20. Okay. For when ye were, oh no, wait, oh, sorry. Move, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Okay, please hold it. Notice he says that the law, the Ten Commandments, entered into our eyes, right? When the Ten Commandments came to, to the people on the mount, chapter 20 of uh, Exodus, it came to show us not how we can live, but how we're not able to live. The Ten Commandments is not giving, oh, they're beautiful, amen, let's live them. When God gave him the Ten Commandments, he says, go ahead, he says, this is my standard. And Moses said, he was sad because he understood. They can't do this. He says, give it to them. And he puts the Ten Commandments out and he goes, Man, thou shalt not commit adultery. Uh-oh. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt honor. They were realizing, we can't do this. 
So the Ten Commandments was to increase the offense, meaning it says, you know what? I didn't know that I was coveting 